Hello. Um, thank you for joining us for Buki's latest webinar presentation. My name is Jason Wagner, and I'm going to be presenting Buki's Sepicor Flash Chromatography System. I've named this presentation um, Chromatography Solutions for Difficult Separations. And uh, what I hope to achieve here is to show some of the hurdles and roadblocks that we all face when trying to do preparative chromatography separations. Uh, a little bit of background on myself is I've been with Buki for the past eight months. Uh, for 10 years before that, I was a medicinal chemist in a pharmaceutical company. So I've done uh, multiple uh, separations and, and dealt with many uh, small organic molecules on a daily basis. So I, I bring a, uh, a technical background uh, based in the lab on these separations. And these are some things that I've come across that um, may help you and uh, also hope to show you how our system can help you in your, in your separations. Uh, this presentation is being recorded, so it can be viewed at any time. You can review it um, uh, for your information in the future. At the end, I will also present my contact information for any questions, any concerns. Uh, feel free to contact me by phone or by email at any time. So I have a lot of information uh, that I want to go through here, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, the basic outline, we're going to talk about sample loading techniques. The first thing you have to do is get your sample onto the column, and that can be tricky in different situations, and we'll talk about that. We're going to talk about uh, actually performing your separation on a column and how you're going to choose which column you want to use. We're going to talk about the advantages to our detector and the additional detectors that can be added to our system. And then finally, we're going to talk about fraction collection, the final step of your, chrom your uh, chromatography separation and how we can uh, collect fractions in a multiple uh, uh, variety of vessels. So we'll start with sample loading techniques. In a perfect world, you take your sample and dissolve it in a small amount of your initial organic solvents and inject it onto um, your column uh, via syringe. Um, and we have a simple injection valve that has a, a one-way ball valve that when you stick a lower lock inject, um, syringe on, you inject your sample directly onto the column. But what do we do if our sample is not very soluble in the initial solvent system? And this is a problem that I've run into many times. If you're going to run methanol methylene chloride and your sample is not soluble in, initially in 100% methylene chloride, you might have to add a small amount of methanol, which could affect your separation, um, but you also can possibly have your, your compound precipitate and crash out onto the column, either in the syringe or sometimes in the ejection valve. So this is common with polar molecules, especially in more nonpolar solvents, something like hexane or, or PET ether. You can have your materials precipitate before you're actually able to start your chromatography. It's also very common in my experience with reverse phase systems when you're using water as your initial solvent and you're, you have organic molecules that maybe aren't very soluble in water. And once they get onto that column or even in the, in the injection valve, once they see water, they could precipitate out. So in these situations, you can have significant back pressure on the column. And if you have a pump that can push through that and columns that can handle that, you can slowly maybe help dissolve that solid. And that kind of brings us into our first talk about the systems themselves. And the heart of any chromatography system, in my mind, is, is the pumps. We have two pumps that we offer with our systems. They're uh, identical uh, on the outside to, uh, to view them, but one pump, the C601 on the top, has a max pressure of 10 bar, which is 145 PSI. And the second pump is a higher performance pump that's rated for 50 bar, or 725 PSI. And at this pressure, you're running into the medium pressure chromatography range. And it opens up a lot of windows with um, doing reverse phase chemistry as well as doing large columns and high flow rates. So on the topic of flow rates, both pumps are capable of 2.5 to 250 mils a minute. Um, you'll see that 250 mils a minute is a pretty high flow rate for one pump. If you're running both at the same time, you can have a uh, run a very large column. And the other thing to note about our pumps is that there are three piston pumps, so there's a pulse-free flow. Basically, what you, you have is a, a constant stream of pressure instead of a, a pulsing effect within the column. So if you can't inject your sample as a liquid, 
what else can we do? So one thing that's become very popular lately, and I've seen it around a lot, is doing a solid sample injection. And what that involves is taking your sample, your material, and dissolving it in a solvent that it's soluble in, and then concentrating that down onto some sort of solid phase material, usually silica gel, sometimes sea light. So this is a solution that we've addressed by um, what they call a prepolute cartridge. And on the bottom, there are two pictures. On the left is a, is a polypropylene prep elute cartridge. And what you can do is you can fill this cartridge with your material dried onto silica gel, dried onto sea light. And we offer two sizes, up to 9 grams. And then the other size is a little smaller, up to 4 grams of material. And the way the cartridge works, you can compress your material into um, a small space so you don't have any dead volume. So you could actually load 50 milligrams of material in there and have um, no dead volume within the system. So uh, it's a nice way to add your solid sample onto your column. If you need to add a larger amount of material or you want to run a that with your own material dried on the silica gel or sea light and add that in front of the column and it will slowly dissolve on while your, your solvent um, goes through the system. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the solid phase materials that you can use. Um, I picked out three, silica gel and sea light are the top uh, in, in my mind, but people also use fluorosil. So the pros on, on silica gel are that you can sometimes hold baseline materials, the stuff that doesn't move on your TLC plate that's just on the line. And the advantage there is you're not adding that to the top of the column where it's just going to sit for the entire run. You're going to uh, basically uh, pre-capture that on your solid phase and only add the compounds of interest to the column to do the separation. Another pro for silica gel is the dissolution limiting prevents precipitation. So what that means is when the solvent um, has to dissolve the material off the silica gel in order to add it to the column, so that way um, it doesn't just wash off the silica gel and then precipitate later on. Some cons with silica gel is that it can retain some compounds permanently that you don't want it to. You also get more separation within that column. If you have a long, thin uh, amount of silica gel with all your material dried on it, some of it's going to come off at the bottom faster than at the top. So you can also adversely affect your separation by using a, a lot of silica gel for your compound. The other thing is it's slightly acidic. Uh, if you have a compound that's not stable in silica gel, obviously this is an issue. And some people are also worried when you concentrate your material on a silica gel, you need to heat it usually you know, on a road of app or something like that. So heating and on a slightly acidic material isn't always the best solution. So another option is fluorosil. One pro with that is that it's neutral. Uh, a con is that it can retain certain compounds. This is something that needs to be tested uh, before you run uh, the column to make sure that your material will not be retained on the, on the fluorosil. In my experience, I've used sea light an awful lot. Uh, the pros with that, it's neutral. It doesn't retain compounds. And the nice thing about it not retaining is as soon as the solvent front hits that sea light with your material adsorbed onto it, it all pushes off and flows onto the top of the column uh, more in a narrow band, uh, in my opinion, than it does coming off of silica gel. So one of the cons there is you need to add a little bit more sea light than you would with silica gel just because it doesn't have as much um, uh, surface area or capacity to hold the, the solid sample. And since it does flush off the, the sea light so quickly, you can have sample precipitate on the column head if you have a, a very insoluble compound. So it's something to try. Um, those people out there who are, you know, are using silica gel might want to try sea light um, and see how it works with their compounds. The, the non-retention factor is, is a big benefit in my opinion. So another uh, thing I wanted to talk about with a solid sample injection was doing this in a parallel uh, synthesis type of fashion. So on the bottom right we have a Syncor polyvap it's called. The Syncor is a, a parallel evaporation system that we also sell. And I'll also talk about it later with our fraction collector. But what you can do with this Syncor, it holds multiple tubes of, uh, of your sample. You can put your sample in with the solid phase of your choice, and you could dry multiple samples all at one time. Um, and we can also use a rotavap condenser. There's a condenser shown hooked up to the um, Syncor, but you can also use a condenser that's built into your rotavap. 
but you can dry multiple samples at one time and then sequentially take those and ch chromatograph them. So I just wanted to discuss that, you know, this, there's an, other ways to do this uh, in, a, in a parallel synthesis fashion. And the other advantage here is that you get uh, high solvent recovery. You're not just using nitrogen to dry your sample and blow in uh, organic solvents off into the hood or into your vacuum lines in your, in your lab. The next way to get a, a sample on after um, just using a small syringe or doing a solid load is to do a large liquid injection. And you'll see that um, there are four different vessels that we have here available that go from 100 milliliters to actually a full liter. And the benefit here is you can load dilute samples onto a column, that's something that needs to be dissolved in a large volume of solvent. But also, if you're running a very large column, we have prepack columns that go up to uh, 1,600 grams of prepack silica gel. So that's up to 160 grams of material that you could load onto the column. You obviously are going to need quite a few milliliters of solvent to dissolve that and add it to that. What this system does is it allows you to add that large volume in a closed uh, system. There's a dry gas pressure feed on top of this column. And when you use it in conjunction with a valve system, you can add your solvent directly onto the top of the column without having an open system, without having to use very large syringes. Um, and you use that pressurized dry gas to push it onto the column. Uh, these columns are made of glass. They're plastic coated because they're under pressure uh, to add in the safety of those columns. So now that we know a bunch of different ways to get the material onto the columns, how do we choose which column we want to use? Well, there's different columns, and then there's also different phases within the columns. We offer three different types of columns. We have pre-packed columns that are shown vertically in the, in the stand arrangement there uh, that a, a lot of uh, flash chromatography systems have. But we also have glass columns that you can pack with your own material, and then we have polypropylene cartridges that you can uh, pack using an instrument that we uh, that Buki sells and has invented. So I'll go through these three different column choices. The prepack cartridges are a lower lock connection. They can fit into our instrument and any other flash chromatography instrument as well. They are packed with 40 to 63 micron silica gel, so it's a, a narrow range of silica gel that, that aids in the flow through the system and also the separation ability of it. Um, these columns are in normal phase silica gel are uh, nice. You can pull it out. It's pre-packed. You use it. You flush the solvent off, and then you discard it. So it's a very quick process. There are also some columns that can be reused, like reverse phase and amine columns, that can be used and then stored in solvent and then reused again. So it's a nice, quick solution for chromatography. We offer multiple packing phases that I'll talk about a little bit uh, further on. But we offer these in 4 grams up to 330 grams for most. And then in silica and reverse phase, we offer 800 and 1600 uh, gram columns. So we're talking pretty large columns. And at a 10% load volume, you're, you're up to 160 grams of material that you could add to a silica or reverse phase C18 column. The first type of specialty silica that we have is called our HP packing, and it's high, it stands for high performance packing. On the graphical representation below, you'll see a normal silica gel column, four grams, with three different peaks in there. That is a theoretical plate um, calculation of 82. The high performance four gram column is 185, so more than double the theoretical plates, which equals more separation efficiency. And that separation that you see on the second graph the baseline separation that you have there, you could actually load more material because of that increase in separation. So if you have a difficult separation, you can use high performance packing, but also by using the high performance packing, you can add more material to the column than you typically would be able to with a larger particle sized column. So this is a graphical representation of how to, how to get started choosing some of the different phases that are available for, for flash chromatography. Um, you know, in a, in a perfect world, we'd all have low and medium polarity compounds that would just separate just fine in silica gel in your normal solvent systems, but that's not always the case. So I have uh, little pictures below of our dial cyanoamine, 
our reverse phase C18, and then strong cation exchange, which is SCX, um, a, a toxic acid derivative. And um, here um, is how you would pick, say, a charged molecule. You would typically do a reverse phase, or you could use a strong cation exchange and do what's called a catch and release type of column. For acidic and basic um, molecules, uh, regular silica gel, but then also using the cyano columns is a good choice. For a high polarity, usually reverse phase is a good choice, but if you don't have access to that type of system, a cyano um, or even amine columns also work well. One thing that you'll notice, and I'll, it's the same slide, but I've highlighted cyano um, um, silica gel, cyano uh, cap silica gel, is found in all of these categories. And the reason being is because it can be re used as normal phase or reverse phase um, silica, depending on the solvent system that you choose. If you use an aqueous system with uh, you know, a methanol or acetonitrile type of solvent system, it can be used as reverse phase, but then you can use it for hexanethyl acetate, normal phase chromatography. So that's one, if you were gonna have a few uh, extra types of silica gel laying around, that would be one that maybe you'd want to stock because it can be used for various things. Now I do know that most people have a large stock of normal phase silica gel, either, either in bulk form or in pre-pack columns, and sometimes that's what you have to deal with. So these are just some things that I've um, kind of come across in my experience. And, and you have compounds that are not stable in silica gel sometimes. I've taken HPLCs and you see one peak and you put it on a TLC, and for some reason there's two peaks there or there's three peaks there. And it turns out your compound can decompose or do other funny things on normal phase silica gel just because of that slight acidity. What you can do is you can deactivate the silica gel by you condition the column in one to three percent triethylamine solution. And then from there you can run your, your sample safely and you don't need, actually need to use any more of that um, triethylamine solution in your solvent system if you don't want to. You could continue using it if you, if you felt that was um, necessary. For very polar compounds, uh, typically I would run from 0 to 20% methanol in methanol methylene chloride. I put an asterisk there because a lot of people are, are wary of going over 10% methanol in their solutions um, because the silica gel begins to dissolve at a certain undetermined point because it depends on what the quality of the silica gel that you have. Um, if for any case, if you use 20 or 30% methanol and there's a small amount of silica gel, what you can do is take your sample, redissolve it in methylene chloride or something like that, and then filter off the silica gel after you've concentrated your fractions. But another way around using such a high amount of methanol is to add ammonia or ammonium hydroxide to your methanol solution, usually in a 10%. So that way when you're using 10% methanol, you only have 1% of the, the, the base in there. And what usually what happens is your, your molecules will, will have a higher RF, they'll move faster through the column, but also it can help, help sharpen up peaks, especially tailing peaks that tend to drag off uh, for a long period of time. And then for charged molecules I have below, you know, if it's charged while well, it's on the column, it's going to have a lot more interactions on the column and have a lot of tailing. So you can, an acidic compound, you can add some TFA or formic or acetic acid. And basic, you know, we have triethylamine and, and ammonia there um, to help modify um, the solvent system and keep those peaks nice and sharp. Okay, so that's, that's what I have for the prepack. Uh, columns. Now I'm going to talk about the polypropylene cartridges that we can, you can pack um, yourself using our instrument. It's called the C670 cartridger, and it's pictured on the right. I have a, a neat video of it working, but it doesn't work on this um, webcast. So on the next page, I have a, um, a little stepwise um, picture pictorial on how to get how to pack your own column. But uh, I did want to mention that the C670 is now included free with any of our full systems. It's the X10 and X50. That's a complete system with pumps, the detector, fracture collector, and computer software and all that kind of stuff. So um, it's about a $5,000 value, and we're offering that free with uh, our full systems at the moment. So I'll show you real quick how this works. Uh, on the top row is the cartridge empty. In that glass vessel, is, in the bottom is where you're going to put your silica gel, but the bottom is actually a frit. So you're going to have dry gas that um, you hook up to the instrument. Dry gas will bubble through the silica gel and fluidize it. 
And what that does is it makes it uh, more homogenous, so you get an even packing when you pull the silica gel up into the column. Then the other uh, component of the system is the, the tube at the top, and there's like a wand up there. That wand is actually hooked up to a vacuum source, a vacuum that you would use for, say, a rotovap. Um, in the second row, they show filling the silica gel, putting that black lid on there. And it's kind of hard to see in the picture, but that black lid has some tools in it that help you pack um, the fritz into the polypropylene cartridges. So the third picture on the bottom, they show a polypropylene cartridge putting a small frit in the bottom. Then they hook it up to the vacuum source and stick it in the, in the silica gel. They show on the top of this page, uh, turning the vacuum on. With, in the second picture, you pull silica gel up into the cartridge while it's under vacuum. You keep it under vacuum and you pull the cartridge out. You flatten the surface of the silica gel, and that's what the, the turning arrows is indicating. And you put another frit on the top of the, the lid and seal off your cartridge. Turn out the vacuum and unscrew your cartridge and, and you're good to go. Uh, if anybody would like uh, to send me an email later, I can send a, uh, um, a video file of this. It's, it's around 10 megs, so it was, it's a little bit large, but it's actually neat to see in person. So with that cartridge, what you can do is pack, use your, you can buy bulk silica gel, reverse phase, whatever you, whatever you choose. And, you know, in the U.S. it costs uh, two to three cents a gram to buy bulk silica gel, and you can pack your own columns. And those polypropylene cartridges can be reused again. You just have to replace the fritz. So the other, the third choice that we have, other than the pre-packed columns and packing your own, are glass columns, which also you pack by your own, but they are... Um, made for higher pressure um, uses, also for very large scales. So we have a column that is almost a meter long and 100 millimeters wide, if you choose. But we also have small columns that will only hold you know, 4 to 10 grams of material. So with these columns, we can uh, se separate almost 400 grams of material on the large end. Um, they hold a lot higher pressure than any pre-packed polypropylene cartridges. Uh, pressures up to 50 bar that our system is capable of. And you also have clear glass that you can see your, column, your compounds as they move through the column. So once again, you can pack these on your own with any, any um, silica gel that you choose. It's also a really good choice if you have a reverse phase column that has you know, more expensive reverse phase silica gel and it's going to be reused again. You can pack one of these columns and then use it multiple times. So the next thing I wanted to talk about was our detector capabilities. And the detector that comes with our full system is actually a uv vis diode array detector. Um, the diode array is usually seen in HPLCs, not so much in the, in the flash systems. But what, that, what it offers us is uh, four wavelengths of detection. You can monitor four wavelengths at one time. You can collect based on those four wavelengths. You can also collect based on one wavelength and just monitor the other three. It gives you lots of options. Um, if you just want to see 254, that's fine. You can base your fraction collection on that, but you could also put in some other wavelengths and, you know, just be certain that there's nothing else in there that maybe you would want. The, the range is 200 to 840 nanometers. Now, on the diode array part, uh, on the bottom picture, you can see we can do on-the-fly scans of the full UV this spectrum from 200 to 840 at any point during the run. So if you see a color coming off the column, and it, when it's in, whatever's in the flow cell is what's going to show up, um, it, what it's going to do a full scan on. So if you see a color come off, but it's not really showing at 254 that you chose, you can do a full spectrum scan and see what the, the max absorption of that is. It, at the top of any large peak, you could do a full spectrum scan and see if maybe you have co uh fractions or maybe just a, a better uh, UV vis uh, signal for your next time that you run. Maybe it's actually better looking at 260 versus, um, you know, 240 or something like that. So it offers a lot of flexibility in just one detector, once again, four wavelengths at a time. Now, this is a very exciting piece of equipment, but what this controller does is um, talks to the computer and talks to all the parts um, that are included, so the pumps, the fraction collector, the detector. And what I have circled in red is another four ports that can be um, used for additional detectors. And at the end of the year or the beginning of this year coming up, 2013, we're hoping to uh, release an ELSD, uh, evaporative light scattering detector, 
that can detect any um, any compounds that are passing through, no matter if they have a chromophore or not. But you can also hook up a refractive index, fluorescence, conductivity, various other types of detectors can be hooked up and used simultaneously with the um, C640 UV Vis detector. So you can actually have eight different signals that you're determining uh, your fraction collection on or that you're just monitoring. So it offers a lot of flexibility for, for even for compounds that don't have a good chromatophore in your, in your separation. So here's uh, just a little bit about the ELSD. Uh, it's a, it's a, a standalone uh, piece of equipment that comes, uh, you know, beside the instrumentation. And uh, the, the uh, graph I have on the right shows a, a UV chart in black with just one peak uh, here for the chromatophore. But there's also um, a, a steroid type of derivative in there. And you see a strong peak in the gray from the ELSD that you would not have detected without this ELSD detector. So uh, it offers more flexibility with, that, with being able to see um, other molecules that are in your sample that, that may not have a chromatophore. So the last thing I want to talk about quick is fraction collection. And it doesn't sound very exciting, but what we have for our fraction collector is a very large bed that you can fit up to four of our uh, fraction collection racks on. That will do collect up to 12 liters of solvent or up to 240 fractions in smaller test tubes. So we offer three different size test tubes standard uh, with the system that you can choose from. But on this rack, you can also fit any vessel of your choice. So that's what I want to show you in the next, in the next slide. We have a rack wizard where you can build your own racks, save them, and then use them in the future. The rack shown here is a pre-programmed rack that was um, shown in the picture before. It's got 25 millimeter test tubes, and you can see you fit 30 in each rack, and you can fit four racks on there. But say you wanted to collect large volumes of, sol of solvent. This rack that I created has 12, 250, or maybe 300 mil Erlenmeyer's. And there's a picture on the left there that shows you a, a picture of what uh, glassware you've chosen, and I added that in. So any anything that you um, want to collect in, you can add that so that way when you're using the system, people will know, okay, well, this is set up for an Erlenmeyer. But what you can do here is collect large volumes of, of sample in any type of uh, vessel that you want. So just for fun, uh, I made this rack with 100 shot glasses um, just to show that even a small, if say it was a scintillation vial instead of a shot glass, you could collect in, in small uh, vessels. You could also put two liter uh, bottles on there and have it collect in them as well. The last slide that I want to talk about with the fraction collector has to do with our parallel evaporation system. And it's a small uh, graphical uh, picture on the left there that shows the rack itself, but you can see it's, it's um, 12, uh, 12 position uh, collection. And what you can do is use this uh, aluminum block rack on the fraction collector, collect your samples directly into it from your uh, chromatography, and then take that rack and put it right onto the Syncor uh, parallel evaporation system without any solvent transfer. You don't have to dump tubes in anything. You can just move that right onto the parallel evaporator and concentrate it down um, to dryness, or you can actually do it to a residual volume if you, if you so choose. Um, so uh, the other thing, the other advantage here, once again, with this parallel evaporation is you um, have very high solvent recovery. Uh, I think it's around 98%, but you're not blowing that into the hood. Um, you're also not having to transfer over to a rotavap and using, uh, having to concentrate down multiple samples at different times. You, you can do it all at once. So I know I rushed through a lot there. Um, we're running close to our half-hour time limit. Um, that's the conclusion that I have. Once again, I know that I've talked about a lot of information. So and if anybody wants to contact me, my email address is my last name, Wagner, W-A-G-N-E-R, dot J, for Jason, at Buki.com. And my direct phone number is 302-225-2442. And I wanted to see if anybody had any questions here. Okay, we have one question. Can the fraction collector itself, can the fraction collector be used by itself? Yes, the, the fraction collector, uh, any of these, 
instruments can be used, uh, well, a lot of them can be used as a standalone instrument. The fraction collector can be set, it has its own uh, screen on it. It can be set to collect uh, via time so if, or, or volume. So you could tell it to collect um, 30 mils in each tube, and you could actually hook that up to uh, a gravity column in your hood. You know, an old glass column that you use an air pressure to push through, you can have the fraction collector and fraction collector switch tubes at certain times and use that just by itself. Um, the pumps can be used. They need to have a small controller uh, used with them, but they can be used on their own without the full computer system. Uh, so there are multiple variations of, of how you can configure um, the, the, the parts of the Sepicore. Okay. And uh, the other one was, do, we, do you need to use a computer? The, uh, like I said, you do not need to use a computer. Everything um, can function on its own. Um, there are other small controllers that you would add that isn't necessarily a computer, but a small screen with different choices on pump flows or to set up the fraction collector. But a computer is not needed to, to run these instruments in a lab. And I think, I think that's about it for time. Uh, once again, I welcome any questions um, or, or any concerns or, or whatever um, about my presentation, and uh, I'm glad that everybody was able to attend and look for more Sepicor presentations in the future. Thank you.